What's up, everybody? Welcome to what will actually be the last Tequila Tuesday powered by Patreon. Because from this moment forward, everything will be powered by GTM United. We've been slowly migrating everybody over there. We've got about 25% of the uh, Patreon community over there so far. Today's really the first day that we've officially launched. Uh, so not much will change. Things, things will be a, a little bit easier. You got things in your calendar, RSVP. It'll be a lot easier for everybody. All the Zoom info will be in the event all the time. So I don't have to field messages from people saying, how do I get in here and all this kind of stuff. So uh, <clears throat> I'm excited about the, uh, the evolution uh, and, what we're, and what we're building. So thanks for being a part of uh, a historic show, as I told Joel a little while ago. Uh, we've got a really timely topic, I think, today. It's a deep one. We're going to talk about eliminating negative beliefs. Joel and I were talking a little bit uh, before everybody got on about, you know, things that have been going on and the markets and uh, layoffs and maybe people behind or missing their Q1 goals and stuff like that. This could be anybody from AE to a CEO and founder to a consultant like myself. I um, think we're all going through it a little bit, maybe having some questions about ourselves and our teams. And so lo and behold, Joel is here to talk to us about eliminating negative beliefs. Joel Bine, if you don't know him, is the CEO at Career Hackers. And uh, he's been there, you started that company a couple of years ago. Well, you, I guess you didn't start as CEO potentially. We'll let him get into it and tell his uh, story. So I'm going to get out of the way. Joel, welcome to Tequila Tuesday, man. You're in charge. Right on. Thanks so much, Scott. And thanks, everyone, for being here and, and for welcoming in, welcoming me in here today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, so um, let's dive into it. My name is Joel, and uh, I'm CEO at Career Hackers, and our mission is to uh, help people discover and do what makes them come alive. So... You can check out careerhackers.com. It's our, it's our website and basically we're, we're a media company and all about empowered mindset and going after what you want in your life, forging your path and so forth. And yeah, we have a podcast, we have a daily newsletter, we have hundreds of articles, we have live events. And basically the way I see it is we're, we're looking to help people move from a 20th century to a 21st century mindset into a, a value creation, unstoppable entrepreneurial mindset and not waiting for permission, not worried about following the rules, not worried about blending in with the crowd, but say, Hey, what do you, what do you want? What makes you come alive? What makes you tick? Go after it and create it. And I, I envision a whole, a whole world where not just entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs, right. Where employees at companies are, we're taking the reins and creating value um, and becoming an artist, you know, as Seth Godin would say, becoming an artist rather than a cog in the wheel. Um, so that's kind of like the high level of like what our mission is and, and it makes me come alive. It's, it's my mission is, is to support people in coming alive. And along those lines, we're rolling out this, this new service to help people kind of shed the old mindsets and shed any of that self-doubt, any of that friction, any of that resistance that could be kind of in the subconscious mind, you know? So I see this as kind of a one-two punch in what we're up to at Career Hackers with, hey, let's, let's empower people at any place in their career, you know, leaders, entry-level people, career changers, job hunters, especially right now in this economy, especially right now, as Scott mentioned, with so many factors that are kind of narrowing in on us in terms of mental wellness. And so all this is kind of, is so key right now. And so this one, two punch is like, Hey, let's, let's create as much content as we can to, to help inspire people and empower people and support people in, in their sphere of control, right. In their creativity, all those things at the same time, let's see what's below the hood potentially in the subconscious mind with beliefs that could be holding us back. It could be that like emergency brake that's up um, while you're trying to drive the car. And I think this is especially applicable to people in this audience 
who are high achievers, right? Who are high performing people, sales professionals. I think this can be a, a method that can be valuable to anybody in any place, almost anyone on the planet, I think it could benefit from this method, which I'm gonna get into the details in a second. But basically this, this can be for anybody, but I think it's especially helpful for sort of people who are entrepreneurially minded, leaders, executives, people who are those sort of sort of go getting high performing types who might have those high standards to themselves. And the, this type of, these types of limiting beliefs can get in the way. And I think it also can be valuable for people who might be, you know, entry level BDR types, maybe people on, on your sales team who might be struggling with, with call or resistance, call anxiety, that type of stuff. And so I'm going to kind of cater to, to both those sort of types of people, whether you're a leader or you're leading other people. Um, you're leading, whether you're a leader or you are actually a, a being led rather, um, I think this can be applicable in many ways. So that's kind of the overview and let's just kind of dive into the, exactly what the problem is here. Um, obviously we need to be problem aware in order to find our solutions. So I think as high performers, a lot of us kind of tend to hustle, we tend to be driven, we, we tend to pack our days with productivity. And sometimes that can get tied up with our self-worth, you know, especially we're coming from backgrounds, maybe we're, we're high performer, high performers at sports growing up, you know, and we kind of learn to be that high achieving person. And that ends up getting conflated with a sense of self-worth and it can create these sense, these sort of inner critics in our head, the self, self-hate, the inner chatter, which all, all those types of voices in our head, I think we become accustomed to them. And it's like, that's just kind of what we need to deal with. We need to power through it. We need to muscle through it. We have this anxiety or friction or fear or resistance. I wrote friction twice on my slide, error. Anyway, the point is that this stuff kind of becomes the norm. And what I'm proposing here is with this method is we can actually clear out the resistance to begin with at the root. And this method has completely changed my life. I've struggled with my plenty of my own insecurities over the years, got a lot of personal growth work, a lot of tools over the years, and this is the number one tool I've come across. And so I've been working on myself the past couple of years with this tool and it's transformed my life in so many different categories. And now I'm trying to share it with people. So you also have like sales specific type things. So you might have like call reluctance, call anxiety, fear of rejection, right? let's say for a BDR making the first cold calls. And you might say, yeah, we just need to get through that by, by doing repetition, right? We just need to get custom to that experience and then we'll, we'll end up um, alleviating that anxiety. And I think that's true. And what I would say is, can we again, remove the anxiety from, from, the, from the root? Why is there a fear of rejection to begin with? I think a lot of this goes back to our subconscious beliefs. So again, we're looking at the root cause here. That, this is a method, and and by the way, after this presentation, this will go like twenty minutes, and then would love to to show somebody on this call how this belief works in action. So be this belief method works in action. So, uh, so we need a we need a brave volunteer to <laughs> to gear up for this. You don't have to volunteer yet. Not right now, yeah. Somebody be ready. Awesome. Um, yeah. So I think this method is really revolutionary, and I've. I've heard people say things like this, you know, this is years of therapy in a few weeks type stuff, like powerful stuff. Um, so what's going on deep down, there might be wired in thoughts, beliefs, concepts, and ideas. Like I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy of success. I'm a burden. I'm lazy. Sales is dishonest. Money is evil. So this top group, I would say, is more like the self-worth type category, which, of course, is going to affect our performance, going to affect our every area of life. I'm not good enough is one of the most common beliefs I've come across in doing this work with dozens of people. And, of course, that's, that's at the subconscious level. We'll talk about that in a second. But the sales is dishonest. I think this is a really interesting one. I actually had this belief. I think I finally cleared this one about a year ago, and it was huge for me. In just showing up on sales calls and just asking for a sale in that sort of friction, that, that just little tingling of, of resistance that might be there. 
if you have this at the subconscious level, because I think we grew up, we grew up in a culture and it's not like sales is presented to us in school. It's not like it was a lot of, of these, you know, caricatures of what sales looks like that we kind of absorb through the media and that the stuff could be kind of going down at the bottom of our subconscious mind. So I want to emphasize it's not, this is not you that actually believes these types of things. It's not the real true you. So I like to refer now to the movie Inside Out, the Disney Pixar movie, which is an amazing movie. Uh, Disney can be profound as well as light. And so basically, if you haven't seen the movie, there's a character, Riley. It's an 11-year-old girl and her family moves across the country and she's sort of upset because of this move and she's trying to adjust to the new, <clears throat> the new life and new town and everything. But inside of her head, they're depicting characters inside of her head. And so there's, there's anger, there's disgust, there's joy, there's fear, and there's sadness. And much of the movie is like joy is trying to get sadness to be happy. You know, everything's fine. Look at this. This is great. This is great. And the point of, I mention all this now is because I invite you to think that about the psyche in this model. I think this movie is actually depicting the psyche in a, in a very accurate way, which is that we have a, a multiplicity of parts, right? You, have, you might have part of you thinks this, part of me feels that, and we kind of colloquially understand that. And so when we're identifying these beliefs, I invite you to be aware that you have a conscious mind that might completely not agree that the belief's true. That's fair. We, we know these things aren't true. I'm not good enough on a conscious level or whatever the, the belief is. But is there some younger part of you that is holding on to this from something that happened earlier in life that could actually be creating that friction? So where did this stuff even come from? Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of places it comes from, but it's from certain experiences we had at certain times of our life. That could be when we're 25, when we're, we're 22, when we're first having a first sales call and we're like freaking out about it, or it could be when we're six and we were trying to, you know, shoot a basketball and we failed. Like there could be all sorts of things. And a big one, and this is a big, a big topic for me that I like to, to, to riff on is like, what are some of the things happening when we're going through school? And, you know, we have this industrialized schooling model, basically, that's going back to the 19th century and we're we're kind of in this system of sit at desks do your homework and get your grades avoid avoid pain and punishment no exposure to business of course essentially um and this is going on for 15,000 hours you know for uh, for most people you know most people going through traditional school and i'm actually a former teacher so i i know this i know this system inside and out really and um you know, there's a lot of, of well-intended teachers out there, but basically we have a lot of these, these systems with, with the grades and sit in desks and follow the rules, wait for permission, go to the bathroom, not getting a lot of choice, autonomy, freedom, independence. Right. And we're kind of like, okay, we got to make sure I do what I'm supposed to do to, to please the authorities, you know, please the teachers, get my grades, all these things. So in these types of systems, I think a lot of these beliefs can kind of form. And here's a, here's a, here's a big list, or here's a solid list of even more beliefs. And I would invite you at this, at this point to maybe just kind of read over these, maybe just ask yourself, do any of these seem real, again, to a part of you? And it can be a little uncomfortable to talk about this stuff. And I, I'm aware of that and appreciate, you know, I appreciate that. But this is kind of the, if we can kind of go and compassionately, what I say, hug the cactus, look at anything that might be going on below the surface and just give it a big warm hug and be like, okay, this is happening. Then we can embrace it with some self-love and self-acceptance, and then we can move through it. And then we can, on the other side, be more free. So I don't matter. This, that was, I, I've had most of these beliefs, by the way. Um, I can't do it. That was the, one of the first beliefs I ever cleared. That was me when I was in preschool, uh, 
the memory that was associated with this belief for me was in pre, I was in preschool and I was trying to do cartwheels. <laughs> I couldn't do it and everyone else could. Um, and then what happens in these types of experiences is we wire in these beliefs and we extrapolate these absolute statements that end up affecting us in, <clears throat> in all areas of life. So we have these like self-worth and we have work ethic. I'm not doing enough. I don't work hard enough. This is really common. Um, what makes me worthy is working a lot was one that I had, you know, and of course, lots of beliefs about money and sales that can be really applicable. So this is what I think creates resistance. Many of you might be aware of the book, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, who is really valuable in his perspectives on creativity and productivity and so forth in in battling what he calls battling through the blocks, right? And resistance is basically just those feelings we have in our gut or whatnot that create the procrastination or the hesitation or the apprehension. And it doesn't feel very good. And it can create that self-sabotage, all sorts of stuff. And and Stephen's method is essentially to to power through that resistance. And when you power through, then you can create the results. And that's that method is that mindset is really valuable. And I think the resistance is because of these beliefs. The resistance is there in the first place because of the beliefs. So resistance could be any type of resistance, but even, but again, for sales specific, this could be really applicable for sales calls and so forth. So <clears throat> what if we could just remove the resistance or remove a huge chunk of it? For me, I, I feel like the past couple of years doing this belief work, it's just been like 90% of my head, the voices in my head are just gone. Um, it's not like I'm, I'm still working on myself. I'm still finding beliefs for myself, but the resistance is massively shifted. And this is a very, this is a new paradigm. This is a revolutionary stuff in my opinion. So I'm going to explain a little bit more about how this works in this method. But the best thing I can do, I think, is to show you the method. Um, to show one person on this call the method. And then I'm also just, I'm offering out one hour complimentary calls right now. So I'd love to just show you this method because it's, I mean, I would love to just give you that as a, as a gift um, so you can experience it. Because it's one of these things, it's like, great, really? Is this really, you can just clear these beliefs out, you know? And that is what I'm proposing is that I can take one of these beliefs in about 15 minutes. I can pluck it out from the root and it's gone forever in 99.9% .9 of the cases. So let's take a look at how this works in how we're going to pluck this out at the root. Let's say you have an experience where you're a kid and you get bit by a dog or something. It's pretty pretty scary and all that type of stuff. Well, it's possible that you might wire in a belief like dogs are dangerous. So that's the event. And then you dog bit you, right? And then you made an interpretation that dogs are dangerous, which is completely valid, <laughs> especially if you're like seven. It's completely valid to interpret reality that way because you're trying to stay safe first and foremost. And so that creates the emotion when you see a dog in the future, you have this experience. If you have this belief gets wired in, then you see a dog, you might feel fear, worry, anxiety, overwhelm. Totally, totally makes sense. But if we can pluck out at the root, the belief itself and jiggle it free and realize it's not actually a true statement. Then we're not going to have that. They're not going to have the anxiety anymore. When we see a dog, we're just not going to have that automatic physiological response because we've unhooked the thought and belief from the emotion. Hey, Joel, real quick. Uh, <clears throat> the right side of this slide is kind of cut off a little bit. Oh, so I can I only see. read event interpretation and then it says EM. There we go. Oh, I guess it was just my window. It's better now? Okay. Yeah, so another example 
might be if you a common one that I see is failure isn't safe. And, you know, we're, we grow up, we're, we're avoiding getting the F on the report card and we might have pressures from, from various angles to get to live up to certain expectations to get a certain grade. And we might wire in this belief. And so again, it's, we're having an event. We see F on our report card and our parents are mad right? Then we're creating an interpretation that failure isn't safe, which creates the emotion. And we, we fear the failure happening in the future. So what I'm proposing here is we can get down to, again to the root and we can clear that out. The thought and the belief, and then the emotion goes away. So it's, it's, this, is the, this is the kind of the prerequisite is the thought creates the feeling. So yeah, and this stuff I think is revolutionary and it's going beyond something like affirmations, which you might've experimented with, right? And affirmations often can get a, a bad rap because it's, it can seem, seem silly. They seem to not stick, right? And of course, this is referring to the Saturday Night Live skit. I'm good enough, I'm smart oh, enough. Good. <laughs> and uh, it's Pretty kind bad. of... It, it's kind of become like uh it hasn't been taken very seriously affirmations. And that was me for a lot of long time. I would do, I would do like I'm I would write down in my journal, I'm enough, I'm enough, I'm enough. And I didn't really do anything. I literally recorded a whole podcast with my friend, like talking about like strategies to like show yourself that you're enough. And so <laughs> and then we came across this belief method and we just cleared the belief I'm not enough. And it hasn't been an issue ever since. Like just boom. And so the, the affirmations end up being often what I call putting the air freshener on the dog doo-doo. It's like, if we have this root problem of the negative belief, then the affirmation often will not actually make much of a difference or it might just mask the problem. So another way to look at it would be, let's take a, a tool like, Let's take a tool like meditation, which is a great tool. I still meditate. It's a great tool to calm the mind and so forth. But if that's your like only tool, let's say, you have, say, say you have lots of voices in your head and lots of anxiety and so forth. So you do the meditation. It's kind of like if you were mowing the lawn and all these dandelions are in the field, you mow the lawn and then the field looks nice again, right? It's cleared. But in reality... If you, you say, so let's say you meditate and then you feel calmer. Great. But really what can happen is this, the anxiety comes back because we didn't clear the problem at the root. We didn't pluck those dandelions from the root. We trimmed them. So we might've calmed the nervous system by doing our meditation, but fundamentally we still have this sort of neurological wiring happening at the root from our subconscious mind that believes I'm not worthy of success or sales is dishonest and so forth. And so these things get, can get re-triggered. So that's the, uh, that's the, that's the gist of it. And again, I want to, I want to take a volunteer in a second, but I just want to like, yeah, paint a picture here of like, Hey, we can clear. I really want to just underscore, Hey, th this is huge. We can clear one belief. Like I'm not good enough. And it'll be gone forever. And you'll feel more free. You'll feel more empowered. And this could be affecting your career, affecting your leadership, affecting your relationships, affecting everything. Even if you're on the outside, you're performing at a high level and you're bringing in six, seven figure deals, whatever. If there's still something holding on from the deep subconscious, that's still going to be affected. You're still going to feel that some, you might still have some sort of imposter syndrome or self-doubt, right? And so if we can clear this at the root, it's gone, you know? And that's just one belief over 15 minutes. So now think about like, if you're, you know, I have BDRs on your team, whatnot, your, your sales team, you're coaching them on, on building their confidence. Well, if we actually get down to the root and we clear stuff like about sales and money, clear stuff about self-worth, fear of rejection, then the call anxiety is just reduced. 
it's, it's, it's reduced forever. And so th there's a lot, there's like all these intangible ripple effects that it's, 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 it's I think it's impossible to actually calculate. <laughs> um, but like one thing I like to highlight as someone who's focused on careers, you know, is the, the ripple effects of just being happier, you know, as a leader or as, uh, as one of your employees, right? So happiness is going to symbiotically support productivity and sales and all the things. And so I, I like to, I like to highlight the fact that there's an integration between mental wellness and business performance, business success. I think there's, it's been great to see the past few years, more and more awareness about mental health on LinkedIn and, and in the career world and so forth. And sometimes I wonder, is that stuff kind of siloed? What's like, okay, let's focus on business. And then like, okay, now we got to check the mental wellness box over here, work-life balance. And we kind of like create this silo effect between work and mental health. And what I like to, to, to invite is when we can focus on, on these beliefs, we can actually, we can actually bring it all home together. And we can have, we can have our cake and eat it too. We can be happier. We can be he healthier. We can be more mentally well, and we can actually perform better. So that's, that's the overview y'all. Um, we'd love to, to see if there's a volunteer that might want to try there, this out. Before we get to the volunteers, is there any questions yeah. or comments, things people want to um, kind of get into a little bit before we get a volunteer and kind of demonstrate the methodology? Yeah, I got a question. Yeah, um, go ahead, Evan. So, so you showed a whole slide of a whole bunch of negative beliefs, and you talked about the uh, Pressfield book, uh, the the War of Art, and how it's all about basically busting through these negative beliefs um, that are holding you back. Um, you also like as as we're going through that list, you're like just give each one of these one, give each of these a hug mm -hmm. From where I sit. Those seem like two kind of very different responses to the solution because blasting through it is one thing, uh, giving it a hug, embracing it, accepting it, making peace with it, living with it, you know, do it scared. I think is the, is the saying that I, I I've heard a lot. I, I guess I'm just curious, which, which side of those are you on? And I completely understand, like, this is a paradoxical stuff, human psychology, yeah, yeah, yeah. rife with paradoxes. So it could very easily be both of these. Um, but I guess, are, are you leaning more towards the, the question is, are you, are you leaning more towards the give it a hug type of mod? Or are you giving it, are you more on the give it a blast through it kind of yeah. side? Uh, that's a, it's a great question. And yeah, I think I love philosophizing and I think, the paradox is, is great to point out. I think it's both and uh, ultimately. And I like to highlight both sides of that and acknowledge Pressfield's value in suggesting, hey, you can power through and you can create the results that you really want for yourself if you, if you can have that courage to go right into the resistance. And what I just say is that if we can actually clear out the beliefs, the resistance won't even be there. Now that's a process. Like if you clear one belief, it's not like all your resistance is gone from one belief. That one belief will be gone and it'll make a, it'll make a dent in it, but there could be a whole cluster of beliefs that's creating the pattern. So what I do is, and like, if we have a volunteer, then I would like ask you like, what's a pattern in your life? What's a, an experience you're having when you're, and when you're doing X, you feel Y, right? When you're on a call, you feel anxious or whatever. And then we figure out what are the beliefs that might be creating the pattern. So yeah, what I say in terms of um, teaming both those together, you know, it's valuable to take Pressfield's approach, but my critique of Pressfield is that he's not really questioning the root cause of the, of the resistance. Anybody sure. else? Go ahead, Jill. I see your hand raise. Yeah. Um, oh, well, is this when you want me to talk about my living belief or are you still asking for questions? 
Oh, you were, did you volunteer? I volunteered. Jill volunteers this tribute. Okay. Unless there's other questions. For was there any, was there anybody else who had questions that we don't need to rush into the example yet? I've, I've got a question. Yeah, go uh, ahead. So in the past, I've done a lot of self work from, you know, it's getting personal, but Al-Anon mankind project. So like Jungian shadow work, um, is this, and, and I did it in my twenties of basically, you know, reenacting past events that happened in my life and facing that, is this very similar to that? Or is this a different thought process than the Jungian, the Carl yeah. or Carl Jung, uh, way? Yeah, I think that method and modality is really valuable and there's so many methods and modalities that are very valuable. And this is what I would say is it's distinctly different in that it's a very left brain process. And it's basically, we're gonna connect with this part of you that has a belief and we're asked, most of, most of the process is asking just questions from a left brain standpoint. And so it doesn't need to be Sometimes it can be emotional, but it doesn't need to be. Um, and it's getting just right to the con the conceptual level, right? Because the, the again, the concept in our mind, interpreting past events is what creates the feeling. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's the Mankind Project's great, Shadow Work, all that stuff's great, you know? I think it's, it's another tool and maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the most expedient tool that I've come across. Awesome. Anybody else with questions? Okay, Jill's ready. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready, but I'm All ready right. to go. <laughs> um, Doing it anyway, though. Yeah. Well, you know, you said overcome my fear. So here I go. Yeah, this is step one. You're already doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Jill, I'm much like Chase. I've done a lot of work. Um, I've been in therapy on and off for years and done Landmark Forum and Tony Robbins and all kinds of things. Um, so I love the idea of releasing my limiting beliefs forever. I have this like recurring fear, thought um, that I'm not, I'm not doing what it takes to be successful or like it stems from when I graduated, got my master's degree, my MBA, I had this dream for years after that I didn't really graduate, that I never took my final exam. Like I would wake up and, you know, think, wow, I didn't really do this. Um, not true. I never even got like a notice that said I didn't do it, but I still feel that way. Like no matter what happens, good or bad, I still think about what I didn't do. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what's, what's an example of how it's affecting you like right now or in, right, well, this week like, and like what, what's a certain moment certain pattern that's happening in terms of you know maybe when i close the sale i feel i yeah I second guess myself i think about everything okay. i should have done or could have done to okay. do better to um make the deal bigger if the deal fails i think about myself like and this not happens even if you're even if everyone's praising you and there's all on the paper, like this amazing I, external achievement and you still have the inner stuff. Is that, is that most accurate? It, really. I think it's that I don't believe it in my core, despite a lot of external reinforcement. I just, I don't believe it intrinsically. Okay. So is it specifically about your performance, you would say? Um, no, no, I mean, I had a lot of success really early on. I was uh, president of a, a public company or division of a public company, I helped take it public. 
all before I was 30 or in my very early 30s, made a ton of money. And then for a while, I did it. And so it's been hard to get back to, um, like, I have all this, you know, self-doubt or regret, you know, because I, I took time off. I had a winery for 20 years and I had my own business and, you know, and although I'm from the outside looking in, I'm very successful and I'm respected. Yeah. My employers respect me and I have a lot of kudos. I just feel like um, I'm... I'm not making the money I could be making. I'm not you should be doing, doing as more. much as I could be doing. Like, I'm just not working harder. Okay. Were there, does that feel like a true statement? I don't work hard enough? Oh, yeah. No, no, it feels, but I, I'm trying to relate it back to okay. the original statement of like, you know, the nightmares. Of I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to gain, I'm just trying to kind of work with you to find the most impactful belief that we could clear right now. No, I appreciate All right, it. So I, I think I can suggest a few that you might have, but is, was there anything that when you saw the slide, were there any of those beliefs that you remember that was like, yeah, well, I, I got, have that one for sure. I can't do it. I'm lazy, not doing enough. Okay. I can't do it. So scale one to 10, 10 being the strongest, how strong is that? How strong is it? I feel that way pretty strongly until I right. rationalize and think through things, and then I see, Jill, you've done it. But right, and we're and we we'll, and remember we're just we're just curious about spotlighting that subconscious part of you. Yeah, so yeah, you're, I can't do it. Yeah, for sure. I'm imagine if we could just clear that out and liberate yeah. this part of you, then we wouldn't need to do the rationalizing rationalization. <laughs> well, for sure. I mean, you know, it just. I mean, when I was growing up, I would get five A's and a B, and my father would say, mm -hmm. well, what's wrong with you? Get the B. Like, it mm -hmm. was always, no matter what I did, it wasn't. Is there a sense, is there a sense, Jill, that there's something wrong with me? Hmm. Could be. Could be. I can't really think yeah. about that just, not just, there's just gut, gut feeling does that seem does it resonate or does it sound no i don't think okay. there's something wrong with me i think i just compare myself too much to yeah. others and you know because it was like beaten to my head when i was younger that i wasn't doing enough i wasn't good enough i wasn't smart enough i wasn't you know all that do you sense that you just have i don't i'm not good enough it could be yeah yeah yeah. Yes. Not okay. That was me. I would be. Yeah. I would be. I, would be <laughs> I just idiot. had to think about like, I don't know. Yes. Yeah. Well, there's there's a cluster, right? So there, again, we have these different buckets of, of beliefs about self worth, about the work ethic piece, you know, mm -hmm. approval from others, perfectionism, people people pleasing, money beliefs. There's all sorts of different buckets. Yeah. But it's not really uh, about others it's about myself like i mm -hmm. don't feel um happy with where i am ever like no matter how much i achieve yeah. i feel like i should be doing more could be doing more well um, if you're open to it i'd love to try i'm not good enough yeah that it feels strong enough that it's worth doing well i think it all rolls up into that maybe okay yeah Okay. So you, if you say that belief, if you say that statement to yourself, you feel it. Yes, I feel. Okay. I'm feel the weight of it. A little bit warm okay. and okay, you know, like nervous and. So, so I want you to really take note of that catalog, that feeling right now, and then you're gonna at the end of the process, we're gonna check in on. It. Okay. Now, before we start, I just want to mentioned to you and everybody that we could also have meta beliefs about change and so often when i work with people is i actually before we do those big hefty beliefs like i'm not good enough i'll, I'll work with people on, on beliefs about change like change can't be fast 
change won't last. It's not possible to change. Change has to be hard. So if these beliefs are there, it just can create some meta blockage, if you will, in us realizing that the, the, the belief method worked. It works either way, but just, just want to put that awareness out there for everybody that, that, that those change blockers can start having us question whether the, the belief clearing worked and whether it's actually gone forever. And by no means am I saying, oh, believe me just because I said so. You know, that's why I encourage people to to try it out. Because then you can then you can ask yourself, is this still gone? You know, the first belief I ever did was I don't matter. Two years ago. And I'll still check on it. I'm like, does that sound true? And then it doesn't sound true. So it's still, it's like, so anyway, you 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 get to decide for yourself how it feels. Um, I just wanted to put that awareness out there about the change beliefs. We'll, we'll skip that for now, but um, I just want to put that out there. So you, you feel this feeling in relation to this idea. Okay. Yes. So trusting your subconscious mind, can you tell me when in your life did you first conclude I'm not good enough? As a child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As a um, pre- adolescent maybe preteen kind of time um when i noticed i was judged differently than my siblings you know more was expected of me mm -hmm. and no matter what i did i couldn't get the acknowledgement or approval of my father mm -hmm. so interrupt the flow but can i ask a question real quick where what um are you the oldest the youngest or somewhere in the middle no child? so it's it i don't behave like the middle child but i'm the middle child and i'm the okay. most like my father my father was in mensa and masters in tax law and really brilliant um and he saw me as the most like him i mean mm. i'm not all of those things that he is but so and my brother was um, he kind of skipped over him because he didn't think he could accomplish what was expected. So all the pressure kind of was on me. And my sister was yeah. five years younger, so they were, you know, by that point, they weren't really that hard on her. I don't so know. This was sort of a, all good, all good. So Jill, this was sort of a, obviously like sort of chronic type of experience in that environment. Was there any, any specific, <laughs> yeah. any specific memory come to mind? In particular, um, no, it's okay if it's if not. Yeah, it's it's just more that you know the, the memory that comes back all the time is that I didn't really achieve the successes that I achieved, and I wonder, like deep inside, are they true? And even when people tell me they're true, and you know, yeah. get awards and recognition in my community I serve on boards and all this stuff I don't really feel like I'm adding value and so was there anything specific that happened with dad or mom or oh my god that we don't have enough any... time but yes well, just, okay. <laughs> I mean that's why I spent all that time in therapy yeah we don't we don't, mean, we don't actually don't need to talk about those all those memories I was just curious if there's one particular that came out um... if not we don't even need to talk about it He's yeah. Curious. Okay. So one example that, that comes back a lot. So he told me if I got a certain GPA, I would get a trip to Europe as the reward. And yeah. then I got the GPA. And then he said, I never yeah. said that. Okay. And I didn't get the trip. So it's like that. So I have trust issues. Clearly. Yeah. Well, you might have other Around beliefs like that. I can't trust other people. Yeah. yeah. Or but yeah. Or maybe I can't trust them with what they say about me because it's not. Yeah. True. Yeah. Okay. So, Jill, it makes it makes total sense that you would have concluded at this period in your life, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. Just want to acknowledge that it makes sense that you would have concluded that. Mm -hmm. Now, that's one. However, that's one interpretation of your experience is I'm not good enough. Okay. Right. Another interpretation isn't. I'm not good enough is the truth. 
forever in all situations, but rather you're not good enough at certain things. Is that another way to look at it? Well, sure. I mean, when, when um, I think about things and I measure them empirically, it's not a true statement that I'm not good enough all the time. I mean, it's just, yeah. but I, that's my default. Yeah. And so what I'm doing now in this first step of the process is just again, we're connecting to this younger version of you mm -hmm. and we're having, Hey, Hey, younger Jill. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. You conclude I'm not good enough. There's another way to look at it. Actually this, and we're, I'm not actually asking you to let go of the belief yet. Mm -hmm. I'm just kind of making some suggestions so we can kind of loosen it up a bit. Okay. So just going to ask you a couple of questions and other ways to interpret it. So you would agree it's like another way to interpret it would be like, yeah, not, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough at certain activities. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's that it's about the activities and the skills, not your essence ontologically. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Is it possible I that? Yeah, another yeah, interpretation. Well, I mean, with sports, I could say that I'm not the most. Um, yeah, maybe you're not good enough. At that guy yeah. in Pearl. Doesn't mean you're yeah. not good enough. Period. Yeah. I was just I was just pulling out random sports out of my head. <laughs> so, is it possible that it's the interpretation of your experience growing up is not I'm not good enough, but rather it was nothing to do with you, and it was 100 percent about your parents. And it yeah. was 100% about dad. And even if he was doing his best, that he had his own experiences. Me, but it's not yeah. necessarily what I always feel, right? I, I mean, got you. We're just, we're just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you would agree that's an interpretation, that it was 0% it was about you, 100% mm -hmm. about dad, and that he might have been projecting mm -hmm. because when he was a little boy or a teenager or whatnot, he had his own experiences and he hadn't quite processed those yet, right? Mm -hmm. And so he saw you and he was trying to help support you in getting your needs met to grow and learn and accomplish. And he wanted to see his daughter become, to really flourish. That's ultimately was intention, most likely, but his strategies weren't in alignment with that, alignment with that perhaps because he had his own insecurities that he projected and that's actually 100% of the reason why that he said those things about the Europe trip and everything else. So again, we're just asking, is that a possible interpretation of your experiences? I mean, for sure. I mean, he wanted what he wanted. He wanted me to go to law school mm -hmm. and be in practice with him and all the rest. And so whenever I deviated from his view, he was punitive. Mm -hmm. So would you agree that I'm not good enough is one of several interpretations of your experience? Yeah, sure, of course. Great, great. All right, we're doing great. So when you think back to your experiences, specifically, let's take when he said, I, I don't remember saying I'm going to give you a Europe trip. And similar experiences, you probably had feelings, right? Come up, like anger, anger, frustration, frustration mm -hmm. shock, annoyance, disappointment. You probably just had a recipe of feelings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you kind of get in touch with those feelings right now? Oh, I can. Yeah. <laughs> I can. And, yeah. you know, all that, I'll prove you wrong stuff and I'll show you. And, yeah. you know, yeah. So you had feelings and it was rep repetitive. You had <clears throat> these experiences throughout this environment you were growing up in and you had feelings. Now, obvious question here, just, just bear with me. Would you agree feelings are bodily sensations? Say that again, feelings are what? Are bodily sensations. Oh yeah, That's I'm feeling it right are. now. Okay. My nervous, my heart is beating. Nervous <laughs> system, heart rate, yeah. blood pressure. Muscle mm -hmm. tension is shit. That's what feelings literally are. Yeah. Signaling to our to our minds to try to get needs met. Mm -hmm. So 
what we're seeking to do right now is look back at these memories and be really objective with what happened. So dad said something to you. Made a promise. You felt, well, even that's an evaluation, right? Well, okay. So we're looking at what can a video, what can a video camera pick up in a sense? Uh, so he said words. Yeah. You felt feelings. Right. Okay. Right. So you had feelings and sensations in your body. Did you ever actually feel I'm not good enough? Or did you feel sensations? I felt it in, with him, I felt anger, but with, it morphed into I'm not good enough in school and, yeah, yeah. you know, so, my acting, all the stuff. But literally, you felt sensations in your body. Yeah. I'm seeking to make a distinction here between the feelings and the concepts. Okay. So did you actually feel I'm not good enough? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or did you feel your heart rate shift? Oh, I see. Your nervous yes. system. Okay. Shift. I see. I see. Feelings are bodily sensations. So mm -hmm. yes, I felt um you know, this catch in my throat, which I have now, I felt like my my heart racing. Um, the adrenaline was going, my brain was like, you know, yeah, with all the things I wanted to so say. I'm not good enough mm -hmm. was not a sensation. No, just work. Okay, great. We're doing great. So yeah. let's shift to our sense of eyesight. Mm -hmm. When you look back at the memories growing up, mm -hmm. just look around the memories, sense of eyes, eyesight, right? Mm -hmm. You Sorry, saw kitchen things. table. You saw <laughs> furniture, you saw a kitchen table, you <gasps> saw dad, his face, his facial expressions, you saw the weird sweater he was wearing, whatever. Mm -hmm. You saw objects and people. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see I'm not good enough? No. 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 I mean, you can't see it. Right. So you didn't feel it or see it. And again, you tell me. I'm not leading you anywhere, actually. Okay. Am I, am I, you just tell me if I'm off. No, you're not wrong. Yeah. I didn't okay. feel it or see it, but I believe okay. it. So you didn't feel it or see it. Mm -hmm. Then where did the belief actually originate? In my own mind. I mean, it's yeah. how I processed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had event, experience, emotions, and you mm -hmm. added with your mind the meaning. I'm not good enough. Sure. I think we all do that with. Which is completely yeah. normal. Yeah. It's completely yeah. understandable, mm -hmm. especially as a young person. Because mm -hmm. we, we're dependent upon our parents when we're young. Because it's yeah. to survive. We need acceptance and love to survive. We, so we, need, we do whatever we need to do to make conclusions. And the fastest way to cope with these types of experiences is to put it on ourselves, to mm -hmm. explain it. So that we can thank the young Jill for all the effort she put in. For all... In navigating this environment and these these dynamics, right? Why do we always what explain you see? it in a way that's negative to us? Like, yeah, do you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I hear, I totally resonate with what you're saying, and that we um, need to rationalize it. It's like a survival thing, right? Yeah. We need to because if, if but it always just... seems like we put it all on ourselves instead of I don't think I think we yeah. wouldn't it wouldn't be if we were to admit that our parents are actually the problem that would be even scarier because hmm. we're dependent upon them for survival but we can we can talk about the why separately okay I want to solve this problem for you yes me too I want so to. you see that you added the meaning with your mind Yes. And you can sort of have these feelings and you conflated the belief, the thought form with the feelings. Mm -hmm. And you wrapped it up into one. I did. I do. 
You see how you created it in your mind? Mm -hmm. You hatched the thought form, the neurons, the synapses with your own mind. Mm -hmm. Experiences happen and you mapped onto reality. <laughs> yeah, you sound a little bit like Joe Dispenza. Yeah, listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that. that's, that's another another whole tangent. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. So if you if you randomly saw a random like 15 year old kid mm -hmm. and she came home and she didn't and she had a certain report card and then dad re reacted angry or whatever. If you just saw that randomly, random people, would you know it's the absolute truth forever that she's not good enough? No, I have it with my own that? kids. I have it with my own kids and I don't yeah. yeah. You wouldn't it's just not we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to logically extrapolate. I'm not good enough is the truth forever in all situations about you just because or this random kid rather, just because that you saw that data, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> can you tell me the name of a friend that you have that you trust in your life right now, but who wasn't around when you were a kid? Lisa. Okay. So imagine when you were growing up, you had Aunt, Le Aunt Lisa. Mm -hmm. You had your regular life and then you had Aunt Lisa and you saw her a few times a week. And you just, she was in your corner. She supported you. She accepted you and loved you unconditionally. And you always just felt free and relaxed and at ease. There's no expectations on you. There's no homework. There's no chores. There's no demands. It's just a just love. relationship. Yeah. And you could get, you were seen and heard and understood and you empathized with and all the good things. Mm -hmm. And you just felt this relief every time you got to her place. Okay. So I want you to imagine that if in this time period with the stuff with your dad, you went over to Aunt Lisa's house and you, you, you told her all about what's going on. You told her about the Europe trip promise. You told her all about how you're trying to meet these expectations. And she just listens and she reflects back what she hears and she's supportive of you, accepts you and all the things. And you just feel relaxed because someone acknowledged your situation and your feelings and needs. If only. In love itself. If only there and then, Lisa. I know. And now, <laughs> and now imagine if she had, after she empathized with you, she said, hey, I don't want you to take this personally. What's going on with dad and other people that are pressuring you to get the grades and I don't want you to think this is about you because really what's going on is we have for one, like your dad, he has his own kind of stuff. He's got his baggage and stuff from when he was growing up, he was trying to meet his parents' expectations. And he's what we call kind of, he's kind of projecting that by trying to kind of demand that you, you meet those and he doesn't feel comfortable with you just with giving you that freedom and acceptance and so forth. Cause he didn't get that. So it's just, it's just his stuff, which is why he's treating you like this. And he's not following through on what he said. It's cause he has these parts of himself that are trying to protect him. And that's a huge factor here. And also the huge factor is like all these grades, these are like extrinsic motivators and you're not getting much choice in this in the school system is kind of a huge issue right now with this situation because they're trying to kind of put you in a box and make you learn this by this certain thing by a certain deadline whether or not you like it or not right yeah and so that's kind of like its own artificial environment in a sense and so you what's going on is like you're trying to adapt to these environments and it makes sense but i don't, I don't want you to take it personally actually dad's reaction and all these things i definitely don't want you to think that you're not good enough just because these these experiences and maybe you're not good enough at certain skills maybe you're not good enough at math class for this in this particular arbitrary standard for learning 
Geometry. That's just a very specific domain. <laughs> yes. I don't want you to take this challenging experience and wire in any more extra meaning to what happened. And I don't want you to think I'm not good enough is just the truth about you fundamentally. That's not true. You're, you are good enough just the way you are. You could fail at everything forever. You could be working at fast food or homeless or whatever. And it doesn't change that you're good enough just the way you are just by being alive and breathing. You're already, already good enough. Wow. Again, there could be some things. You're not good enough at playing tennis against certain people. But there's a difference between good enough at a skill and good enough in your essence. Yes, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. So, Joy, I want you to imagine that you, you had Aunt Lisa there mm -hmm. during this time period. And you, maybe she said this to you not just once, but numerous times. Mm -hmm. And she would give you this clarity and perspective that you could bring back to see your situation, school, parents in a new way. If she had been there, would she, and she had explained all this to you, would you have concluded it's the truth forever? I'm not good enough? No, I, I don't think that thought would have implanted itself so firmly in my brain. No. And what do you think you would have concluded instead about the situation? Well, I would have been able to separate my father's actions from defining who I am. Yeah. Yeah. You could have just had this invisible force field around you. And every time <laughs> dad's projecting, right. you just let it bounce over you. Yeah. And you might even be curious, like, huh, what happened to dad when he was my age? You know, mm. you might even be compassionate and you just wouldn't take it personally. Mm. Have you read the four agreements? Yes, I love yeah. that. You see how he talks about everyone's got their projection, yeah. their dream of the planet he talks about, mm -hmm. their stories, and the agreements. The agreements is when we introject, we take on all those projections. You see what happened is that you agreed, in a sense, with his projection. Of course it is. At the time. Yeah. Now we can look back and we can say, I choose to not take that agreement now. I'm not going to introject. I'm not going to internalize this. I feel like already like my that constriction in my chest and my throat is like releasing. Yeah. Yeah. It's all, ah. on, the, it's all on the body. It's all on the nervous system. It's true. I felt like there was like a rock on my chest. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So hmm. we're pretty much finished. I just want to oh. get a lot of deep work. And I want to, I like to clear the palette here. And then we're going to go ahead and check on the belief again. So to clear the palette, I just invite you to say a couple silly sentences. So say for me, birds, <clears throat> birds never fly. Birds never fly. How, does that sound real? Yeah. Sounds ridiculous, right? Okay, say Scott Lease doesn't know how to sell. <laughs> Scott, after reading Tilly's book, Scott Lease doesn't know how to sell. Does that sound true? It sounds true right now. God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> no. Sounds, sounds pretty silly. Okay, say the way to be red is to be green. The way to be red is to be green. Ridiculous. Okay. Maybe we could discuss what, oh, what that could mean in some other level, but I oh, man. okay. Say I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. How's that sound? Well, I don't have that. I don't feel hot and like anxious when I say yeah. it. Man. So I think I can separate it from. So like feeling from the word. The actual sounds, I'm not good enough. Like I'm not is there is there a meaning and weight in that right now? Not physically. 
I mean, I'm not feeling what I was feeling when I first told you about it. Yeah. And when I was describing what happened, you know, I felt like it was very real in that moment. Like, you know, I was overcome by it physically, kind of. Yeah. Hmm. So do you think it's, do you think it's true? I'm not good enough. Is that a true statement? Um, By itself. And by the way, we're not saying that you are good enough at everything. No, I know. We're just saying, we're just, we're isolating this one concept so that you can have freedom and discernment so that there's not a belief that's just running in the back of your mind automatically, like a computer program that's always on. Yeah. So now you have. It's crazy, Joel, because I've done this, like the Byron Katie questions. Do you know her about the four questions? No, actually. Turn it around. Oh, her work is is great. It's called the work. You ask yourself four questions. Is it true? Do you know it to be true? Could you turn it around? You know, and so, but it never really physically resonated the way I'm feeling right this second. Mm -hmm. So, wow. Well, I mean, I'm confident it's gone. Yeah. If Forever. you were here, I would hug you. <laughs> oh, I would I would hug you back. <laughs> Thank you. So you, you see that oh God, I'm like the, I'm almost giddy, actually. <laughs> I know. When I when my friend cleared for me, I'm not enough, which is very similar but different concept. I remember feeling like it was like it was like X Files and someone pulled an alien out of my yes. body because there was just this this physiological release. Yes. Because again, as a, there's a great book actually called The Body Keeps the Score about, about the nature of, of adverse childhood experience, right? It's like we're, our nervous system folds on. Like, so what we, what we saw, just to recap everybody, the mechanism here is we went and we objectively looked at the conflation that happened with the nervous system fight or flight type response that you had feelings which again got uh, hooked on to the meaning making. And we said, uh, we, we were able to, to logically analyze and let go, separate the, the feelings from the meaning. So that's why you're having this release. Yeah. Thank you, David Duchovny, for getting the alien out. Oh. <laughs> so you're feeling a lot lighter. Yeah, like, no, I mean, actually years. feeling lighter and like freer, maybe. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, that rock in my chat, I mean, and it's hard for me to like, admit these feelings because these are things I, I believe I should have overcome years ago. I mean, so, mm -hmm. so I feel, I felt almost a shame to still have those feelings but yeah right? and that's like that's a whole other trailhead we could go down potentially it's like what is yeah. the reason that you would have to be ashamed about that right yeah and this is nature of these things these inner critics i should have done this it should be more like this and mm -hmm. that's just remnants of our childhood experience when we internalize these types of messages and then we be, we become that inner inner parent or teacher or whatnot as we grow up. Yeah. And and again, I like to emphasize, hey, this is just like there's no shame or blame here. I mean, I think it's it's, it's key to be honest about what happened. Mm -hmm. If we can go beyond, there's a quote by Rumi say, like, "Beyond right doing and wrong doing is a field. We'll meet you there." Yeah. We let go of the shame blame paradigm and when the right versus wrong and the parents are bad or this like we let go of this good versus bad we just say hey what honestly happened and then can we have compassion for the fact that mom and dad they had their own experiences you know and so now is the opportunity with methods like this i believe that we can start to, to interrupt this cycle yeah. And we can start to empower ourselves and we can start to, to be, to be free. So. Wow. Thank beautiful. you. Thank you for volunteering. Thank you. Thank Good job, you. Jill. Ah, Anybody thank have you. any uh, quick questions? So I got to, I got to wrap up in just like five minutes here. Anybody have any quick questions for Joel about uh, 
all this stuff and what they just watched? Joel, if you had to say that you who your ideal customer profile is for for the work that you're doing now uh, around this sort of thing, what would you say are like the criteria uh, that make that up? Yeah, I'd say right now the ICP is entrepreneurs, executives, people who are high performing people would be a great starting point for people who are able to succeed and they know how to press down the gas pedal on that car, but the emergency brake is, is kind of up. So there's the friction. So I'm happy to connect with anyone here. I'm, I'm not I'm going to drop right now my Calendly link to, to just do this process with anyone. Here. There you go. That makes it easy. Yeah. And, cool. and so I'm right now, I'm just in this mindset of just, I want to give value as we kind of roll this out, it's kind of I have a few clients on our audience and, but I know this is like a, it's like a sensitive type of thing. And so I'm being very, I just want to be transparent and being very gradual with like trying to share this with people and just want to connect organically and authentically with people and, and, um, to share this and see what we can, what we can start to, to, to build. So I think individual leaders, entrepreneurs, and so forth get high performers. And then I'm open to having, again, there, I think there's a lot of potential here for, for like sales teams. And that's not something I've done yet. That's something I'm very curious about is working with like an entire sales team or BDRs and so forth. And would you do that work with the team one-on-one -on -one now or as all this would be one-on-one -on -one. Do you think people would be that this open if they were with their peers and their work it wouldn't make it wouldn't make sense to do it in group um oh, okay so you're just saying affect change throughout the whole team affect change throughout the team by saying i'm going to work with you know five of your team members whatnot and very cool. you know, usually i'm doing like eight to 12 weeks of this coaching and these these sessions and we just go in and we we identify the pattern and we and we find the beliefs that are creating that um and we make massive shifts so that's something that i'm i think the best in terms of next steps or if anyone's interested to to connect with me further or potentially work with me or potentially work you work with your team then i would love to just connect and show you and show you this method myself for you um and then we can talk about what that might look like for members of your team and how we can work work together in in new ways. All right, y'all. Sorry to kind of rush us out of here. Appreciate you, Joel, spending this time with us and putting us through this lesson. Really cool to offer your time and uh, willingness to help everybody and dropping your calendar link in there. Grab it right now if you haven't done it. And Jill, good job. Way to be the brave volunteer. We appreciate you. This was awesome. See you all next time. Thanks again, Thank Joel. You all. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Joel.